Movie lovers and cinephiles around the world, welcome once again to this latest edition of Andy Takes On. And today, uh, from my nice chair, I can tell that you're liking it. I see you. <laughs> but today, I am taking on a very interesting movie. So here's the story. On March 18th, 2021, Warner Brothers and DC are going to do something that doesn't happen often in the world of movies. They're going to release the Snyder Cut of Justice Leagues and the stakes have never been higher. I mean, literally. There are legions of fans, superhero fans, that are ready to stake the executives if this movie doesn't live up to its hype. And oh, what hype. And the reason? It's all because DC, despite having amazing intellectual property, I mean the likes of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, despite having all of that, have failed to crack the cinematic universe code in the same way that Marvel has. So the Snyder Cut, which is basically a Justice League do-over, represents a chance for them to get it right and prove that their characters can translate as well to the big screen as they have in the comics and in their animated movies, which I have to say I have enjoyed thoroughly. Fans worldwide have pinned their hopes on the Snyder Cut and have bullied, pleaded, or trolled Warner Brothers so that they released it. And they finally agreed, but on HBO Max because, well, this is business. <laughs> Personally, I hope it works out. But considering Wonder Woman 1984, how do you even say that one time fast? Wonder Woman 1984's dismal failure to live up to the excellent trajectory that was set up by its predecessor, Hope is fading fast. The only reason that I have any hope for this franchise is because I remember that Zack Snyder is the same person, despite his many shortcomings in the DC movies that he's made, is the same person that gave us 300 and gave us Watchmen. So we know that he's capable, but will he deliver? With the Snyder Cut dropping in two weeks, we'll soon find out. But I thought between now and then, why not recap the movie that was, the 2017 version of Justice League and see what exactly the story was. But for the record, and by the way, I'm getting a little bit tired of this scenario that keeps on seeming to repeat itself, whereby Zack Snyder makes a great movie, or makes an average movie, or makes a terrible movie, and then it's only seen to be great once the director's cut or the extended cut is released. We want, as cinematic audiences, to be able to go into a movie house, watch a movie, and be able to judge it on its merits. Not to think that there might be some version out there that we didn't get to see. So I thought, why not recap the 2017 Justice League? Was it as bad as we remember, or were we just deep in our feelings? Join me as I invoke my inner dark side and take on the Justice League, because as you know, I'm here about the movie. Okay, so here's the story. Superman's dead, okay? Like, dead, like thoroughly. We know this is true because it's in the paper. And once it's in the paper, <laughs> it's gotta be true. And the entire world seems to be reeling from the shock. This movie posits a world where the death of Superman sends the entire population of the Earth, by Earth I mean here America, into a death spiral. It's weird because in the last movie, which was Batman vs Superman, he was as well loved on the one hand as he was loathed on the other. But anyway, I digress. As he had become the embodiment of hope, without him, the world sinks into a despair with grey skies everywhere and people kicking over fruit, you know, as you do when you're sad. I don't recognize this world. Neither do I, Alfred. Neither do I. This hopeless atmosphere has awakened the mother box and made the earth vulnerable to alien attack. And the alien in question, Steppenwolf, a lieutenant of his nephew, Darkseid, who is intent on terraforming the earth and turning it into a new apocalypse, not a new Krypton like they did in the last movie. Meanwhile, Bruce Wayne is in his other alter ego. You're thinking Batman, but no, he's the human resources officer. Well, is that, that should be super human resources officer. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich for a yet-to-be-named team, it's the Justice League, and he's on a recruitment drive. Having already discovered Wonder Woman, he's looking to shore up the, the ranks of the League with other members against an imminent threat. His candidate, Victor Stone, a man about whom we know nothing except that he was involved in an accident and his scientist father used a mother box to be able to salvage his limbs and inadvertently turned him into a cyborg. Don't do that, dad. Bad dadding. Barry Allen, a man about whom we know nothing except that he was involved in an accident that turned him into a speedster and that he, his father was jailed for the death of his mother. And Arthur Curry, a man about whom we know nothing except that his mother abandoned him as a baby, he swims the way that Superman flies, and possibly he talks to fish. Do you talk to fish? 
This team shouldn't be called the Justice League. If this was a band, you would want to call them the Dysfunctionals because wow, this is a dysfunctional family if I've ever seen one. When the band gets together, their internal dynamics almost tear them apart before Steppenwolf has a chance to do so. So Bruce decides that the only glue that is strong enough to hold this team together is a resurrected Superman who is stronger than a planet now? Oh, what if you were stronger than a planet? Like how, Sway? How, Sway? Sway? Take a few steps back. To go you ain't got the answers, water. man. You ain't yeah. got the answers. I guess you would have to be if you're going to hold this ragtag team together. So the question is now, will they solve their issues and get their stuff, their acts together in time to solve the group assignment that is Steppenwolf in time to save the world? Remember group assignments? Group assignments suck because there was always one guy who was doing all the work. One guy always sneaking off to eat. Well, I'm just a black hole of snacks. I'm a snack hole. And one guy who was always making himself the de facto leader of the group. Everybody checks everybody else's work. But I digress. Will a resurrected Superman come back as a new doomsday? Did I say new? Okay, those are verbal typos. <laughs> will a resurrected Superman come back as a new doomsday? And will this rushed team up with no backstory be compelling enough to compete with the Avengers? We know that at least the answer to one of those questions is no but hopefully the Snyder Cut can change all of that so looking at the tones and themes of the movie look you can get whiplash from just going back and forth between the jarring changes and shift and tonality of this movie where it is hyper hyper comedic in the one scene and hyper serious in the next and it's a reflection of the different approaches of uh, directors Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon I understand that most of the criticism of the DC uh, extended universe has been around the general doom and gloom of their cinematic universe and perhaps this was an attempt to write that situation or to correct that but it didn't work it only left us with a movie that seems to be suffering from an identity crisis I mean, was I the only one who got the feeling that the backstory of the mother boxes was an attempt to invoke the Lord of the Rings lore? I mean, okay, there was one MacGuffin for the Amazons, one MacGuffin for the Atlanteans, and one for the tribes of men, and one Steppenwolf to bind them all and in the darkness rule them. Or was it one Steppenwolf to rule them all and in the darkness bind them? Who knows? All I know is that this was not supposed to be a return to Middle Earth. I really tried to discover the theme of this movie, but... It didn't really come through. I mean, I get that they were going for a message of hope uh, because it's the symbol on Superman's chest and because they say so in the voiceover just before the end of the movie, but it doesn't come through for most of the movie. In fact, most of the runtime seems to be about despair and then hope feels shoehorned in at the end in a very corny way. The rest of the time, the movie just opts for clever quips and witty one-liners and it has an evident identity crisis. I mean, let's look at the characters, okay? We've got Batman. He's driven by feeling of responsibility for the fate of the world after his role in the death of Clark Kent, as well he should. And he's determined to build the league and it seems like he's almost determined, hopeful, that he'll die in the process? I'm gonna be honest with you, I like Ben Affleck in this role. He plays a convincing Batman and a dashing Bruce Wayne. And then there's Wonder Woman. Just in case you forgot that Wonder Woman is also a social justice warrior, her very first scene in this movie has her standing on top of a statue of Lady Justice. Like, that's the extent of the subtlety of this film. And the movie also fails to answer the most important question about Diana that we've had since the first Wonder Woman. Can she fly, guys? Oh, can she? I mean, let us know. No, we have to pick one. Then there's Superman. Look, a lot of noise has been made about the fact that they digitally remastered Henry Cable's uh, mustache for this movie. But I've got to say, when I went to see it in cinema, I didn't even notice. I don't know. I guess that's just how much focus. I am not paying to the man's lips, guys. Is he delivering the dialogue well? Does he look like a normal human being? These should be the things we're worried about. I think it was overblown. Besides that, he doesn't have a lot of uh, screen time, uh, but his resurrection scene was one of the best, uh, one of the better action sequences of the movie, and that's definitely one to watch out for. Steppenwolf. Now, the most Irish sounding intergalactic villain in history has immense power but dubious motives. Does he want a harem of Amazon wives? You will love me. You all will. To redeem himself to Darkseid by capturing the planet that got away. Or to satisfy an obsession with his mother that would make both Sigmund Freud and Norman Bates creep out. Mother. All while sounding like Liam Neeson? Aquaman. I don't know much uh, Aquaman lore, and I'm not going to pretend, so I can't say if this interpretation of the character is a departure 
or if it's remaining true to the source material. But since in my experience he has tended to be the laughing stock of the league, I'm okay with this general rock star interpretation of the character. My man. Cyborg. Now, understandably upset at the fact that he's never going to peacefully pass through a metal detector again in his life, he's played as one part brooding teenager, one part reluctant hero. But you really do feel for him, especially when he says this. If these are gifts, then why am I the one paying for them? The Flash. I have real issues with the way that The Flash was depicted in this movie. He is not just a comic relief character. Look, as a fan, I know that there are many heroes who have worn the mantle of the Flash in the DC universe, most notably Wally West and Barry Allen. But look, Wally is a joker, funny, quippy, witty, and bungling. Barry, on the other hand, is not, okay? But the writers seem to want to have their cake and eat it too because Ezra Miller played Barry Allen like Wally West in everything except name. Why didn't they just give us a Wally West interpretation of the character? But with all of that having been said, Ezra Miller is pretty entertaining in the role. And then Alfred. Look, Alfred Pennyworth's job is to keep Batman alive and Bruce Wayne flustered. And Jeremy Irons pulls it off uh, masterfully in this role, although he's got some very dubious wardrobe choices. What is going on over here? So this is my take, this is where I get off, right? DC holds some of the most iconic characters to ever be dreamt up. Their iconography alone lends to legendary storytelling because with just a symbol, you can quickly identify the Flash, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman. But what's Thor's symbol? Hulk? Iron Man? DC should be doing much better than it is in its movies and the pressure i suppose will always be very high for those very reasons that said justice league as a movie really shines when the superheroes are embroiled in doing actual superheroics those are the best parts because ultimately that's what we came for the action sequences are a ton of fun but they don't have much substance holding them up some of the set pieces are clearly cgi which doesn't help with the suspension of disbelief in as much as it's a team-up movie it also to his an extent is an, an ensemble cast and I really got the feeling that everybody was really making a cameo. I didn't get the sense that everybody was used to the full extent that they could have been. And maybe that's because there were just so many characters in the cast. It, oh, but just by the way, whilst we're here, is J.K. Simmons in Marvel and DC now? Does he drink both Coke and Pepsi? Ultimately, you can tell that there was a clash of two philosophies on filmmaking and I, for one, will be glad when the Snyder Cut comes out because then we can judge the Justice League that Zack Snyder wanted to give us, even if it is four hours long. As for the one that we actually got, I'm going to give this one three out of five stars. So once again, guys, thank you so much for tuning into the channel, watching what we've got going on for you. Let's have this discussion about Justice League. Are you guys excited about the Snyder Cut? What are you expecting to see? I know that there were so many differences because of the trailer that came out between what the movie that we got and what we're expecting. So drop your comment in the comment section below. Continue to subscribe to the channel. Uh, click on that notifications and let's spread the word and have this conversation before the movie comes out. Next week, we're looking at Batman versus Superman so that we've got the backstory just before Justice League. But in the meantime, those are my takeouts from Andy Takes on Justice League and I will see you next time.